How's everyone today? Great. Are they all here to listen to me? Oh, that's lovely. I'm a veteran of World War II. I was a combat nurse. And believe it or not, I went all the way halfway into Europe, Austria, and all my sights and things I can remember of today. And that's why I guess I'm here today, is to kind of fill in kind of the blank spaces of whatever other ones have talked about and didn't fill in. I started my career as a nurse by training, and uh, then war came, and I was a registered nurse. And I decided I didn't want to be either German or Japanese. So I volunteered. And the building I volunteered in, in New York, I worked in Brooklyn, and I went to New York to do the interviews and so forth for the Army, the e exams and everything, is now green. It has a glass facing on it, but it's still there. And I can visualize it as the red brick building where we went for our medical exams. And we used to have to get time off from our nursing duties at the hospital to be able to go and have our exams done for the United States Army Nurse Corps. So that's how I started on my travels. And that's how I ended up all the way over to Austria. And I hope to go back someday. Maybe it's going to be a long time. I had hopes of having the opportunity of going back when they had the big anniversaries a couple years ago about VD. VA, VD Day. Anyway, I had saved my money, believe it or not, because I was going to go back. The daughter was going to go with me, and I was going to see the battlefields again. I was going to. I landed on the Normandy beachheads with the boys. Of course, now I understand you have you don't do that anymore, but that's all right. And uh, I had the money saved up, but. My s water system broke, the water supply. So I had to have a plumber come and work in the roadways with the, uh, the sewer. And I was amazed. In New York City, if the house is hooked to the sewer, the water system and so forth, the break is an inch in your yard, you pay for it. Cool. If it's an inch outside, the city pays for it. Well, with my luck, I had to pay for it. Well, the first time you went to Europe, Uncle Sam paid for it. <laughs> yeah, but now you pay for your own trip. Right. Well, you said you were at the Normandy landings. You were, uh, landed at Normandy. Uh, what what, uh, what the, uh, unit were you with? What army? I went with the uh, Harvard Medical Unit from Boston. They had to have replacements because the call had come for their unit to be built up. And Colonel Keeler, who I used to say served in all the wars since the Indian Wars, wanted to get into the front lines. So that meant he had to have a full staff of nurses and people. They had been there for many years. They had worked with the British people because of the war conditions that they had been living under without the bombs. Now they had the bombs. So I was sent to help fill in the gaps that they needed with them. And that's where I went and did my service was with the Harvard Medical Group. And there was only a few of us that was New Yorkers. So I was always the spokesman, because I always had my mouth open. <laughs> and believe it or not, it happened quite often that I was the only woman that was willing to talk. And I still am. So I'm here today. Now, I understand now you want me to go into the, when I landed on Normandy, I only landed with men. I belonged in with a group of engineers. And when we crossed the uh, English Channel, they decided the tides had come in, if you remember your geography, and 
it was over my head because I was only five foot. The boys were safe. They could do it with no trouble. So when the landing craft opened its big mouth and let us off the landing craft, one of the engineers gathered me in on his shoulders and we landed that way on the beachheads in Normandy. The boys took us over. And we had no luggage except the gaff, gas mask and uh, our metal helmet and a shelter half on our backs that if by chance we got let it left in the, the ditch, we had something for cover. And of course, we didn't even have K-rations because they were issued after we landed. So I landed on the beachheads with the boys at Normandy, and we went into the village, and we ended up with a hospital that they had emptied out, and that was where we did our work. And I was there. But I didn't always stay home because they would have calls come for people to go out for special duty and so forth. Like I went to Cherbourg and was a nurse to load a ship. They were sending people back home that was wounded and so forth. So I went all the way to Cherbourg. So I covered a lot of territory because I was always willing to do something that was out of the ordinary. So I got all these nice trips in beside. And then, of course, when the call came and the unit went forward, I was with the unit. And we went all the way across Europe. Also, we had lots of nice opportunities of different kinds of work. Like after we were started and our travels, travels went across France, we happened to get involved in opening one of the camps that the prisoners of war had been held for quite a few years. And in this camp, there was four little girls, children who had no one left at all. They were just there. And uh, me, for be my big mouth, I was asked if I wanted to speak to the colonel and ask him, you know, army hospitals don't usually have children. And that was what we were. We were in a regular army hospital. And I was in the surgical unit and so forth. So I went to the colonel and asked him if we would be able to take the children and give them whatever we could. And he said, if we did all the work, we could have the children. So out of the prison camp, the children became ours. And we took care of them and so forth and so on until the French Red Cross could take them. As soon as they were up and working after being prisoners of war so many years under the Germans, we gave up our children. So that was one of the things that I got to do with the other girls that was in the service with me and uh, that doesn't usually happen. From there on, I went all the way across Europe, also involving in with other prisoners of war camps. And I always knew when we went into an area where they had had the furnaces, because we could smell human people being cooked. And it was quite an adventure. And I went all the way across into Austria. And uh, one of my last stations uh, that I worked at was a big German hospital right on the border of Germany and Austria. And they had even the ring still open where they trained the lovely white horses. And of course, I got interested in everything that was going on. So whenever a call came to go out, I was willing to serve. And that was how I got into a lot of problems and things, because the boys always knew they could scream for the little nurse, and she was willing to go. Wow. Whatever the boys had up their sleeve that they were waiting to get help for, the little nurse was willing to go. So uh, when I was stationed out in the into the, when, oh, I have to back up for the Battle of the Bulge, mm -hmm. because that was one of the things that I was at, and that was where I got yelled for by the boys in the Jeep to please come, they needed me. 
So they took me, and believe it or not, that was where I learned that took two men to drive a tank. I didn't know too much about the machinery, except I used to run the jeeps occasionally, and the hospital ambulances if their call came. As I said, I was adventurous. I always wanted to try something new. And if the call came, I was always ready to answer it. I had nothing, so why did I have to worry about belonging? Except the gas mask, and that always went with me. I understand you were very helpful in uh, helping a GI out of a burning tank. Um. Oh, yeah. That was one of the things the boys decided. Uh, they didn't want to leave the boy that was injured he was the driver, as I understand. Where was that, Ella? That was during the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had had a battle, and the tanks were afire. And uh, the fire, the, the, uh, the tank that the young man was in was afire. And the, his companions decided he should have help. So they knew that we were there in that area because uh, we had moved in. And uh, I was yelled for. And believe it or not, the boys learned Sue to scream for the little nurse, because I was the littlest one in the bunch, and I weighed the, lace, the least. And I was the one that they screamed for. So they gathered me in. And when we got to where the tank was, it was a fire, they took me over to the top, and they dumped me in. That's how I got to the bottom of the tank. I never knew anything about what was in the tank, but I learned, believe it or not. Oh my God. So you're down there, they dumped you in the tank? No, yeah, I, they dumped me into the tank. That was the treatment I used to get. Now you're in the bottom of the tank. Tank, and the boy and I, we worked the deal together, and he was taken and removed. How, how did you get him out of there? We, we removed whatever was holding his leg that the other fellows were afraid to move. The tank was hit so that it was kind of broken up and there was pieces of uh, metal and so forth. So I got this leg so the boys up above there could pull him through the hole and get him out. And as far as I know, we had him back at the station hospital or the uh, first aid, the field hospital that I served in. And I ended up, and he went home but I had to stay. So anyway, there was one happy ending, and I was delighted I was able to do it. Whatever I could do, I was very happy to do. So that was one of my adventures. That's some adventure. Well, any other stories come to mind? Oh, I have lots of them. Oh, tell uh, me. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, uh, now this involves the Air Force. You know, the Air Force boys could always do everything and anything. And we had been overseas over there in Europe for quite a while. And when all of a sudden, some of the fellas, of course, they went with the nurses and so forth, decided we should be able to have showers. We were warned when we left Europe, England, I call that Europe, but it was England. We were told that it would take us at least a year to have as much water to use as we wanted. Otherwise, it was the list of bags, the, you know, the, uh, the water bags that they put the chemicals in for us to have water to drink. That was all the water we had that was for bathing and so forth. If you wanted to use what was in the river, that was up to you. You could go down to the river where they used to do the washing and so forth and take your bath if you want. So anyway, I decided I had started my army career with long hair. The women of that day and time all had long hair, and mine was down my back. But I decided I was going into battle. I didn't want to live without water. So I went down to the PX in England, and I said to the boy that was on duty for the hair clipping process of the day, they would be chosen. It didn't make any difference whether he ever bothered before or not. If it was him, he was the one selected for the day. So I went, and I, this young guy, little guy, he says to me, you want your hair cut? I says, yes, I want a GI haircut, just like you. He says, uh, 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 you want your hair cut? I said, yes, I want my hair cut. So he says, okay. So between him and I, we had my hair cut. 
and I ended with a GI haircut, believe it or not. So when I landed on the Normandy beachheads with the boys, they all took me to be a boy. <laughs> because uh, when I landed, that was another little gimmick. When I landed and the Germans were shooting up at us from the top of the hill, we decided I didn't want to get killed at that point. So our helmets had red crosses on and we wore armbands. So my helmet got kind of messed up with a little mud. I made a mud pie and I smeared my red cross with mud and I went in, in with the fellas and they took me to be a boy. So anyway, I landed on the beach hens, and that was where I started. And of course, everything else happened after that. And uh, I was always in trouble. I was always doing something I should not have done. But it always worked out well. Wow. Just like uh, when uh, I was uh, taken out, the sergeant decided we had fought the Battle of the Bulge and we were not supposed yet to leave because we still had patients, that he would take the, the medical officer and myself, who was only the two of us in, in this uh, field unit at that time for taking care of multiple wounded men, we should have a day off. So the sergeant said, I'll take the, the captain first, and then he says, it will be your day. So I said, okay, fine. So I ran the camp for a whole day. Anybody had problems, I settled problems. So anyway, he took the captain out and they shot theirs. We were on a reserve where a German had a French wife and they had deers on, his, on their compound. So they had brought back venison. So that night, everybody had venison, soup or otherwise, and then the sergeant comes to me a couple days later and he says, okay, Lieutenant, it's your turn. I says, really? What are we gonna do? Oh, he says, you'll find out when we get there. I says, good. So we started walking. First he took me down to the canal, that part of France that had lots of canals. So I found out what he wanted to do when he went, got to the canal. He wanted to gather himself a couple German bodies so he could have the medals from the battle. So he dug himself a couple bodies, got his medals, and then we went into a tank corps unit. And that's how the boys decided I should learn how to drive a tank. Besides getting the boy out of the tank, that was before, they decided I should learn what the tank was. So they took me into the field where they had the tanks all lined up. And that's how I learned how to drive a tank. I already learned how to drive a Jeep. Then from there, when that was closed up, that unit was closed up, I went forward again with the, with the boys and so forth. Most of it on my two feet. That's why I don't walk so well now. Anyway, we went all the way across into a big German hospital deal on the border of German and Austria. And that's how I learned what was going on within the, the unit on the ground and so forth. And that was also when I was on my travels in that area that I got to visit Hitler's Eagle's Nest. Wow. Which hadn't been destroyed yet. Of course, once the boys started walking through with their big combat boots and so forth, the place didn't look as nice as it did before. And I was so surprised. He had selected a mountain, and it took 3,000 prisoners to die while they dug the channel from the bottom of this to the top so he could have his eagle's nest. And it was lovely. You could see out of the window into seven countries, more or less. Of course, I missed all the other countries, but that was beside the point. Anyway, I went up to the Eagle's Nest, and they had a double elevator, which I thought was fantastic. The top half was for Hitler. The bottom half was for his people that was with him. And 
The bottom was just an ordinary plain elevator deal, but the top half was glass and red velvet. That was his elevator. And his elevator went all the way up through the floor and so forth, and it led him off in the main house, and his help got off in the kitchen area. That was below. So we tried that, and that was where I went. I was also on Goring's Lawn and picked violets, where they did all the experience, uh, experiences on the men and people. And that was a wonderful visit that we had that day. And uh, I was always out doing something of interest that was different. And uh, that was one of my experiences, was riding up to the Eagle's Nest. While it was still complete, they hadn't torn it apart yet and so forth, with the visiting and so forth. And that was how I heard that they took 3,000 of the prisoners to dig the hole all the way up through to where the, he built his house. Terrible. Of course, if you were real good, you could go down on the steps, but uh, I decided I wanted to try the elevator. Yeah. So I did the elevator bit. What else do you remember about that place? Uh, except, uh, uh, of course, as I say, we were there before it got destroyed and so forth. And one of the things that hit me was how much that reminded me of home when I went up through the kitchen. I also tried the kitchen. I figured I might as well have a full trip besides the red velvet and glass, was how modern the kitchens were in the bottom of where his cooking and so forth was. It reminded me strongly of home with the, all the uh, 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 equipment that you had in your kitchen and so forth because he had the very latest. And it was, I guess it was American made, I don't know. I didn't think to read the labels of that day and time. But uh, it was regular, modern, American ice boxes and so forth and so on, sinks and everything. I thought it was wonderful. And of course, on Goring's Lawn, we, as I say, I picked violets. And then uh, we also went in and saw the laboratories that they used to, to work on the inmates. They tried all kinds of experiences on the men. This can't be easy, but what do you remember about that? Uh, on the... Uh, the laboratories. Oh, they had everything and anything. Anything that they were working with, like the experiences uh, that they were doing on the men and so forth, they had everything right there. The only thing is, I don't believe they used anesthetics too much. They kind of used it to find out how long you could stand for pain. What kind of experiments did they do there? Well, they had a lot of, of them that was going at that time. To, they had one, I think, was on twins, and another one was, uh, they hadn't yet got to the point of cloning. That came much later, thank goodness. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure they would have had one of them. Well, that, that creates something. I think they were about destruction. Um, you saw a number of other things. You told us about Normandy. You've told us about the Battle of the Bones, but you saw a lot of action between them, too, didn't you? Oh, well, uh, I landed uh, on Normandy, and uh, one of the places they sent me was into the Battle of the Bulge. And as I say, that was where I got to learn that the, the tanks were double, yeah. with the boys were yelling for me and so forth. And uh, I, I saw, I went across the, ra the railroad bridge while it still stood. Oh, really? The tank, uh, the, uh, the bridge that was blown up uh, uh, from uh, the Battle of the Bulge, I went across that before it got destroyed. Uh, I was in Germany for 10 days before the bridge fell. So I went into combat by truckloads and convoy and so forth to get to where they dumped me at the next place, which was the big German hospital. And uh, that's how I went across Germany. Everywhere you traveled, you also traveled by airplane. I, I yes, yes, yes. Uh, when I was in Great Britain, and of course, they didn't have 
as many nurses and so forth as we did, and they decided if they could borrow a couple of us, they would. So I was kind of handed over to the German, uh, the British, and uh, they ta informed me that they did most of their travel by airplane. So I figured, yeah, what have I got to lose? So I went into airplane training. And uh, that was where uh, they decided we had to wear something that we could be movable in. So instead of wearing the overcoats that most of the soldiers were issued, we were given the airplane corps overalls and their short jacket. And that was what I wore most of the time. I also wore the combat boots that you tie, laced up and wrapped around your leg and buckled. That was what my shoes were. Oh, with the shoes, I, had a, I have a story. You want to hear stories? Yeah, OK, fine. Uh, I, went, I was sent to the PX to gather in clothing. So we go into the PX, and the guy behind the counter, you know, there was always a soldier given the job. He starts in throwing the stuff onto the counter. So the shoes he gives me <laughs> is big. <laughs> so I say to him, I wore, wear a size four and a half female shoe. He says, well, he says, you're going to get what we got. I says, fine. I says, what's the smallest shoe? I was informed the smallest shoe for a man was a size five. So I said, all right, fine, I'll take them. But I want 12 pairs of socks. And the guy says, you can't have them. I says, that's what you think. If you don't give me, you ain't going to have a job soon. So he says, oh, no. He says, I'll give you 12 pairs. I says, fine. Put them right on top of the counter. So I got 12 pairs of socks. And I always had plenty of socks to wear because I wore three to four pairs of socks per day in the shoes. because. Huh. My foot was only a little guy, and I had to put it in this great big shoe. So anyway, I made it across Europe on my feet with the size 5 boots that laced up and wrapped around my legs. And believe it or not, to come home, we decided we wanted uniforms. The Army didn't supply us with uniforms after we were there for dressing and so forth. When I went in, I wore blue. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, they have my picture as uh, when I first went into the Army when from Camp Upton, and I wore blue. I didn't wear green. So by that time, they had changed the uniforms, and they were now green. So I decided we needed new uniforms. So I got some green material. And the girls decided if I did all the work, they'd be happy to pay to have New York forms. So I went to a tailor. Of course, I spoke German and French. And I got us uniforms. But I had Eisenhower jackets, the one with the belt around your middle. We, I didn't bother with the regular uniform that they had for the women, that they had given the wax and so forth. And when, I, when we came home, anyway, we were dumped to New York. We came home from Marseille, so I saw all the sights along the way. And uh, believe it or not, we came home on a reconverted Italian liner. And what do we meet in the Atlantic? but the hurricanes. So uh, one day, even the captain left the bridge, because it was really something coming home. When we landed in New York, we were sent, taken down to the camp to be returned to America. And there stands this second lieutenant with his mouth flipping. And he was screaming, you can't go in. You can't go in. So the, boy, the, the ladies decided, as long as I was their spokeswoman most of the time, I could go and settle this hash. So the girl said, go and tell him what is going on. So I said, you want me to? And they said, yes. So here I was this little number. She falls out of line, formation and so forth. And I walk up to the guy at the gate, and I said to him, I 
would like to speak to you, sir. So he says, yes, madam. I says, I am not madam. I'm sir. I'm a lieutenant in the army, and I'm an officer. So he goes, yeah, 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 yes. So he says, what can I do for you? I says, what you see here, pointing to my uniform, I said, it's what we're wearing. I said, otherwise you can yell at Uncle Sam and tell him, why didn't he send us the new uniforms? So he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I says, you have two alternatives. One, you can let us in, or two, you can take them off. He goes, no, 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 pass, 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 pass. So when I went back and got into formation, the girl says, what did you say to him? I said, I told him facts of life. And they, they never forgave me. And uh, they put, kept us in camp for two weeks, brainwashing us with the idea. We wanted to serve again because we were supposed to go on to, the Euro, to Orient. Because when I was coming home aboard the ship, from Europe, I wanted to know what were they going to do with us now. And they said we were going to be shipped across. And I said, no, they ain't shipping this body. I said, I've lived in mud enough. I don't want to live any longer in mud. So they said, well, that's where you go. And I said, not, not this little girl ain't. So believe it or not, they kept us in camp two weeks, brainwashing us with the idea we couldn't live unless we went to the Orient. So anyway, I was I uh, got out after two weeks. They let me out. They figured they didn't want to use the space anymore. And I went to New York. We took gathered in a taxi, a couple of us, and we went up into New York. And believe it or not, I re-entered and served for a medical unit in New York, but I didn't leave the country again. Hmm. All right, is my time up? Oh, oh, we've got plenty of tape. Ella, there's so many things. You seem like a lady that never was afraid to, uh, you know, say what she felt to, to fellas. And uh, I guess uh, I understand you met a lot of uh, interesting men in the Army. I heard you uh, met General Patton. Well, I'll tell you about how we got a shower. I think I started that when uh, we had been told. When we left Europe, uh, I rather left England, we would not have a lot of extra water for washing and so forth. So I got my hair cut. But then, when we, came, we were there, the Air Force boys decided we should have showers. So we had nothing where they had stationed us except a tent with, uh, a, if you were lucky, you got a cot. If you weren't, you slept in the corner. And uh, that was it. So the Air Force boys got some tents set. I don't know, but Air Force was always able to do things that nobody else could do. So they got themselves tent sides, you know, sh sheets of the tenting, and they went down to the river. We were where there was a river there in England. Of course, they have water too. And they had built us a, 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 one of those me, maze, as I call them, maze tents. You walked in, you went around a corner, and you walked in. But they had put nothing on top, and there was nothing on bottom. It was just the tent halves around the middle of the shower. But they had hooked us up in, with an engine. They had gotten an engine, and they pumped the river water so that we could have our showers. And they, they were real good to all their companions and friends and so forth. They told them what they had done for the nurses and that if we wanted to, they could go sightseeing. So after we got into the shower deals and so forth, all these planes would go over and over and over again. So, but we decided we were there, we were going to have our showers. So we went and had our showers. But the boys never forgave us for taking showers in our new unit, and they were able to visit us. Wow. Wow. But we were always with the fellas, mm -hmm. or at least I was. Oh. Uh, if there was trouble, I was willing to go, and I did whatever I could. And uh, when I came home, as I say, I joined the uh, hospital unit that was in New York at that time. Mm -hmm. I had left the 5th General and gone into another unit in Manhattan. And I served my time in there. And after I married, I decided I should give my t whole attention to the family and so forth. So the daughter remembers that I left uh, when she was still a baby. 
mm. and I became a housewife. But then I went back and I served my time in the hospital again, and I took up all my other activities. I visited the uh, Holland in general. I don't know how many people remember the hospital they had on Staten Island uh, for the veterans of that day and time before it became a mental institution, I believe. And uh, I even went there. Ella, you could uh, clarify this. I understood that Halloran was perhaps the largest veterans facility we had any place. At that time, mm -hmm. because they, they didn't have time to build anything, really. Uh, they used what was available, and they hadn't really started it as a hospital unit yet, so they kind of dumped us in with the little seats that they used, because it was supposed to have been a, ha a school, the way I understand it. And they had little desks, little chairs, and so forth, and we, that was what we were given to work with. And I was there, and uh, that was how I learned about Staten Island. And, uh, then when I married, uh, we moved into Staten Island, and uh, I remember Holland General. I worked there for a while as a visitor, a volunteer, and I have gone into the hospitals, Staten Island, um, all of them to visit the boys, and I was able to do that until I got so I can't climb stairs and so forth anymore. I, if you do, have an elevator, I'll visit you. Okay. But I won't visit if, you, if I have to climb stairs. But anything you could tell me about uh, uh, Halloran, I would be, I'd appreciate it. How many patients were there? It was full. Yeah, how many? I don't know how many wow. because uh, all I used to do was t uh, ride the ambulance and, and have them taken, and then I was free to go back to the, to the base again. And uh, I served on Governor's Island, and uh, that was where uh, I was, first I worked in the, in the hospital unit, and then I worked in, a lot of the girls wouldn't work in the prison wards. And uh, that was one thing I was willing to do. As long as there was a need, I was willing to do it. And, uh, I'll go back to uh, our stations in England for a minute. And we were given a hospital on top of an of a incline so that our flagpole was used by the, the Germans when they flew over England and dropped bombs in London. They used our flagpole for heading in and out. And uh, we had air raids all the time. And, uh, that was one of the th things that I remember most of, is that uh, we used to have to close the hospital down because of the air raids, because of the Germans and so forth. And that was one of the things that we, I did was on top of the hill. That was when I was still with the fifth general. Mm -hmm. And I understand you flew. In fact, you even parachuted. Did, uh, oh, that, yeah, I was told. First, they wanted to know if I was willing to go and do some extra duty, so I said, sure. So I discovered I was given to the British. And when I showed up, to, uh, the sergeants were always big fellas. I don't know where they dug them up, but we always had big first sergeants given the orders. So uh, I was told that the British did most of their work by f airs. So I had to do air training. And uh, I did everything, but I didn't have to wrap my sh air shoot up. I didn't have to pack my air, sh the, the sparrow shoot. They did that for me. So uh, it came my day to show my <coughs> proficiency in air travel as to how, if I was taken over and dumped uh, by air, how would I go down? So uh, the sergeant loads us up, and I'm with all the boys. So here I get, and he gets to me, and of course he clamped me onto the wire, and he says, you ready? I says, no, I'm reconsidering. He says, like hell you are. And he kicks me out of the airplane. So when I hit the bottom, the man that was at the bottom says, what's the matter with the sergeant? I says, he's mad as hell because I told him I was reconsidering the trip. Oh, he's hell, he says, there goes our day. 
So that was one of my trips down when I, I, as I say, I was always in trouble. I never had to work f for entertainment. Wow. I, I heard that you met General Patton, too. Oh, yes. Mm. He used to come to the base and so forth, and when we were out in the field, and we always knew when he was there, he always had his big mouth open. Believe it or not. And he always wore his pistols. And uh, the, our favorite was Ike. Eisenhower. We were his headquarters hospital as long as we were there in France. And uh, he used to come to visit us regularly. And I never believed the stories about him and his driver. She was a pain. And I still believe she was as of today. Because Mamie was a lady. And we all thought very much of her. And he couldn't bring her with him because he was going into battle and so forth. So we didn't have her with it. But she was a lady as much as we were involved with it. But the driver, she was taken over the command. And uh, he used to come to us regularly. As the hospitals emptied out to be filled in again, he always made a visit. Now tell me, you said that uh, Eisenhower's driver was a pain. Well, what do you mean by that? How was she a pain, the driver? The driver, of course, she, you know, he was always a gentleman, mm -hmm. and she kind of took her duties a little too serious. Oh, I see. Um, uh, she was a good driver, and uh, that was where, if you want to hear one more story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know where I got the marbles, but remember the glass eyes that the boys used to have from marble? They were glass and they had a streak of color in them. They used to be called cat eyes. I don't know where I got my bag full of marbles from. I don't, re I don't remember that. But I had a bag with my cat eyes. And when the hospital unit, the building, the people and so forth moved out, one set of patients would be moved ahead or out into America. We would have to clean the whole place up, and then we'd be ready for the next battle. And one time, uh, we were waiting for our next influx of patients. We had cleaned the hospital up, reorganized it, and so forth. And we had nothing to do. You didn't walk down to the corner to the movies. We didn't have them. And if it was nighttime, uh, that was nighttime. So anyway, I dug up my marbles, my little bag of marbles. And in back of the main tent, we were having a game of marbles. My corpsman and the other nurse and me, we played marbles. And th that brings me to the one of the reunions we had in Washington. One of my corpsmen was there to a union, and uh, his wife comes to me and she says, who are you? I says, I'm Lieutenant Aldrich. I am now Mrs. Bing. So she says, you're the girl we want to see. So I said, fine. So she says to me, he has a picture in his wallet. Wherever he's gone, he's always showed his picture of his nurse, of us playing marbles. I says, he's telling tales out of school. But he said, no, wherever he goes, he, he shows his picture of them and me playing marbles in back of the tent waiting for the next influx of soldiers to come in. And there was I, me, shooting a marble with the cat eyes. Oh, I was always doing something I shouldn't have done. Just like... Uh, at that time, we got a lot of the uh, new foods that we now use without even blanking an, blanking an eye, uh, like uh, dried milk and dried uh, potatoes and so forth and so on. Uh, I got the job. The mess sergeant got colds, and he got sick. And he was a big guy. So you know what the one they pointed to when they made the selection was me. So I got selected as mess sergeant. So I decided that the boys that was the worst off should have a treat. 
So I got to the point where I used to make ice cream with the powdered milk and so forth. And of course, we had the big freezes, and I used to freeze them. But then I used to add a little sauce to the ice cream occasionally. We had a bottle of liquor that was supposed to be resuscitation and so forth and so on. And I used to put a drop of that in with the ice cream. I made the best ice cream there was. So that was how I used to spend my days. I used to always have something going on. Uh, oh, I should tell you one more story. I was doing dressing one day on the soldiers, and I was using my scissors. And you know they have a blunt end on the end of the scissors. So I was very calmly cutting off the bandage, and all of a sudden this voice says to me, how about leaving my flesh alone? So I said, what? Without that blanking an eye, I had nipped him with the scissors as I was taking the bandages off. And believe it or not, they were on his rear. That's where I clipped him. And he always remembered me. Well, you also were with in some very tough situations. I, I understand my, from my friend Bob Carlin here, he's written some things about you, how you refused to leave expected casualties when your unit was ordered to evacuate in the face of an imminent uh, overrun by the Germans. That's right. Tell me more. Please. Well, it, it was just, uh, to me, it was a day's work. I still had my patience and so forth, and... Uh, as far as I was concerned, that was where I was needed. I wasn't needed anywhere else. That was where my boys were, and I was willing to stay with them. Why should I leave? Uh, I could only die once, and besides, I spoke German. So I was the translator. Oh, you should have seen me do, fixing the stoves. That was a good part, too. Yeah. <laughs> For being the littlest one in the bunch, when we went afield, into tents and so forth, we had the little pot belly stoves, and they all had to have chimneys. So the pipes would be put in, and as long as there wasn't a strong wind, you had your stove. But if you had a strong wind, the piping would come out of the top of the tent, and you didn't have your heat anymore. So when that happened, the, the boys would get the pieces of pipe together, and they'd hold me up at the top, and I used to put the chimney back up again, the piping up through the tent again so we could have heat. Oh, they were always using me for different purposes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like the time we went into, uh, we were now in Germany, and uh, one of the truck drivers missed the signal. Remember the cat eyes that the trucks all had? You could only see so much ahead of you, you didn't see everything. He missed the turn. When the rest of the convoy turned, he missed the turn. So all of a sudden, he stops the truck and he says, he gets out of the driver's seat. We were in the back of the truck. He says, ah, it's lost. I says, fine. Where are we? He says, he didn't know. So I says, OK, I'll tell you what you're going to do. He says. Yes, ma'am. I says, you're going to turn the truck around, and you're going to go back the same way you came here. I says, you make all the same turns back. So we started again, and we went back. And luck had it, we ended up in with the convoy again. So that was one trip that we ended up safe and sound. The only thing is, the day that the colonel, the old colonel, decided we should go forward, he had his uh, load and the, he had his nurses loaded and so forth. We had one girl with us that was a true blonde. She didn't need no hairdressing or anything. And something happened, and she had mis lost her helmet. It came off. We were loaded in the back of a, one of these big trucks, sitting on top of the bedding <laughs> rolls. And she lost her helmet. So all of a sudden, as the truck was turning, this was when we were with the old colonel, and he was going forward. 
He took us across the line to start with. So the MP stopped him and infor asked as to where he was going. And he says, forward. He says, no, you're not. He says, that German there. He says, when I move my foot this way, you're in Germany. He says, when I move my foot this way, you're in, uh, in Europe. He says, the truck stops here. So uh, he says, uh, all right, what are we supposed to do? So the, uh, the, uh, the sergeant that was the MP of, the, uh, of that day, he says, uh, turn the trucks around and go back because you're, we're not fighting the war with your people. So uh, the trucks all had to go into this vacant lot. It looked vacant to turn around. And as we go into the lot, she lost her helmet, so here was a pretty blonde head. And all of a sudden, out from the ground, all these heads popped up. Here was the soldiers fighting, holding their posts and so forth, and they were in their foxholes in the front line. So all of a sudden, this head pops up, and he screams, they're fighting the war with women now. That's what we're getting. And uh, all over the this lot, the heads popped up, the soldiers that was stuck in foxholes. So we got the truck turned around. She got her helmet on again, and we went back again to the beachheads. That was where we were stationed was on the beach. And uh, then we went forward. When the line went the other way, we went forward. My God. My friend Bob has written some things that just fascinate me here. So so anyway, will, yeah. I have to tell you, I met a couple of the men at reunions and so forth, and uh, I told them that story about turning the truck around and her losing her helmet where she was a true blonde. It wouldn't have mattered with us where we were brown heads. Anyway, he, he looks at me after I told him the story, and he says, you know what I would have done? I said, no, what would you have been done? He says, if that only happened when I was in that foxhole, he says, I would have made a double foxhole. <laughs> so that's, that's the reaction we got from the fellas. But we always, at least I was always able to cheer them up, because I was always willing to do something. Incredible. It wasn't idea. what I should have done. I was always in trouble. Just like I had to learn how to make coffee overseas and what they did was they put a whole big pot of water on and they dumped the coffee in after it was boiling and then they'd break eggs raw eggs to settle the grounds oh, I, I learned how to do that too and it, I understand that you had cherished a bottle of champagne that had lost its fizz oh that was when I was sent ahead into the battle into the Battle of the Bulge uh, we were taken put out. We were asked who wanted to go forward. So I got pulled out. I said I would go. So I was pulled out. And my roommate, she volunteered too. She was another tomboy. And uh, we decided that we would get together for Christmas. This was before Christmas that we were pulled out. And we had a terrible snowstorm and everything. And uh, the uh, truck I was loaded on, the G uh, ambulance and so forth, we went, we, I lost her. But we figured we'd take the champagne with us anyway. That was our rations that we used to get from England. And uh, so I packed it in my bedding roll very carefully and protected it and everything. And we took off. When Christmas came, I tried the bottle of champagne, and it had taken objection to being traveled. And when I opened, first the cork didn't blow. It was vinegar. I was so disappointed, and so was everybody else, that my bottle of champagne had gone <laughs> down the drain. Well. It's certainly been a sparkling hour talking with you, Ella. I wish I had more tape. <laughs> is, that, is there any like uh, thoughts you might like to leave us with or any other story? No, the only about? thing is, uh, as I said in the beginning, I decided I didn't want to be German and I didn't want to be uh, Japanese. So I volunteered and I went to war. My father 
was a veteran in the First World War. My brothers were all in the second. And I decided this was what I should do. So I went to war. And I can't say I feel bad about anything I ever did uh, or I was asked to do. I, uh, I worked with the fellas. And uh, my sergeant learned early that if I screamed, that meant he shut his mouth up and he did whatever I asked him to do, because I would be left by, oh, I have one more story to tell. We were in the fields uh, in England, and we had a hospital built that was just supposed to be for us, and they built all the way over to the left field another unit where they had the problem children, as we used to call them. And it was supposed to have been absolutely break proof. If you got the door shut on you, you were in it. So we had this place way off to the left field. And none of the other girls were willing to serve there. So as long as they had to have somebody go, I, I volunteered to do the, the barracks do, duty. So I went over to where they had it. And there was a cat trap from that building all the way across to where the main building was. And uh, it was quite a trip. Anyway, this one night I went on to duty, and uh, they let me into the building. They locked the door. And we had an office about the size of this by this, it big enough for a, a pot belly stove and a little desk and two chairs. That was it. So uh, that was the office. So anyway, I was in the office. We had fed them. They had had their child. And uh, it was supposed to be getting ready for snap time, sleep time, bedtime. And uh, I was told to get the fellas ready. So I was in my office. The ward boy was still in the ward office. Uh, kitchen because we had served meals and so forth and everything was calming down all of a sudden there was this terrific noise at the door it was now nighttime who was coming to visit us so uh, I said to the ward boy open the door he says N no I says what do you mean no somebody's knocking to get in so he says I'm not going to open the door. I says, fine. Give me the key, and I'll open the door. So he gives me the key, real brave boy. And we went to the door, him behind me, and I opened the door. There was this figure there with no head and no feet. We had one man that was in this break-proof room who must have been seven feet tall if he was an inch. I used to say he was seven. Maybe he was only six. But the doors in the building wasn't that very high. So I looked, and there was no, no head, no feet. So I says, who in hell is at the door? So this figure says, me. I says, who's me? He ducks his head down. And it was the guy from the break-proof room had broken out, came around. I says, what in hell are you doing here? He says, I come to visit you. He was from the South. I says, fine. Get your ass in here and sit down. Sweet big guy. So the wood boy stays behind me for protection. So I says to him, call the MPs. So he had to call the main camp to get the MPs to come out to the barracks for this one. So the MPs come, and it took five of them to get him out of the seat after I made him sit down. He was going to stay with me. Wow. Well, Ella, I must say this interview 